I asked especially to introduce our speaker today because he's a terrific man. Uh, I'll tell you, I'm so grateful for your being here. Uh, the college is thriving. It's uh, never been so healthy and never been so besieged as it is right now. I was just saying at the table, we swim in the academic ocean, and that's uh, polluted waters. And uh, we make our way, but it's a dangerous time in the world, and we thank you for the blessings you give us, and uh, I can tell you we're doing pretty well. You'll see the signs of it while you're here. Now, I say our uh, speaker is a terrific man. He's actually a man of courage, and I am privileged to have been able to understand that, and I can explain it to you. He's the chairman of Helmer and Payne, as was his father before him, and I think his grandfather, too. Uh, it's the biggest oil driller in the country. And uh, he ran the company for a long time himself as CEO. Uh, while he ran it, it went from 500 million to 11 billion in sales. Uh, he has, uh, where'd he go? He went to Dartmouth and Harvard Business School. Uh, so he went to the wrong college. And, uh, and his five children, whom I've met, and who are tremendous people, also went to the wrong college, a sore spot between us. Um, but I'll tell you his story. I met him first on September 6, 2002. I looked all this up. The price of oil on that day was $28.28 a barrel. Since then, it's been at 132. Right now, it's at 96. The price is relevant because uh, he was about to do something. He was about to bet the company that two generations before him had run on something. And it's a curious thing, and it's actually a moral thing more than anything else. I understand this story because the first great runner of a big business I ever met in my life was a man named Henry Salvatore who helped to invent the method by which we look for oil, the seismic method. And Henry Salvatore actually did the same thing that this man, Hans Helmrich, did. Uh, in the oil industry, the oil service industry, there was a practice of charging by the day. And so if you send a team out to look for oil, you paid them for, by the day. And if you send a team out to drill for oil, you paid them by the day. And of course, think what that sets up in the way of interest. It actually sets up a conflict of interest between the customer and the supplier. Because of course, you want to take a lot of days. And Henry Salvatore got rich, stopping that practice. Radical thing to do, bet the company on it. And on the day I met Hans Helmerich with his five young children inheriting a big company, but not nothing, nothing like it is now, and oil selling at under $30 a barrel, he was getting ready to invent an entirely new kind of oil rig, a rig that could drill much faster and be moved much faster than any that existed, and it was going to cost a fortune. And he was going to stop charging by the day. And the reason is, he was going to drill faster, which is, of course, against his interest, and that's why oil was being drilled for in dilapidated old rigs that took a month to move. Uh, don't know if it's going to work, he said. And I said, why are you going to do it? And he said, uh, this situation is not good. We should fix this. I'm going to try. And if the oil price goes up, we'll do really well if my rig works. Flex rig, is that what it was called? Now, since then, I've, I've met him many times, and I confess that I admire him very much, and also what fun he is. And we're going to have a show of hands in a minute whether he should join the college board now that he's retired as CEO of the company. Because he is one of the best people in business I ever met. Uh, last time I saw him, I went to his headquarters in Tulsa, 
And uh, they've got it down to this now. You go in a room in this big building in central Tulsa, and it's like a war room. There are these huge screens up there. And on every screen is an oil rig and what it's doing right now. And there's engineers, dozens of them, sitting in this room monitoring these rigs. Now, when you drill for oil, uh, you get this guy who's never done anything else in his life, and he's an oil guy, and he's a great kind of guy, and he's got to make judgments all the time about how fast to go. And if he goes too fast, the darn thing will blow up or something or break, and then you've got downtime and you lose time. And if you go too slow, you lose time, and so it's a judgment deal. And this guy tried, has decided that he was going to turn that into the nearest thing to science you could get. And all those engineers sitting in that room, in this war room, and it's kind of like going to Cheyenne Mountain to NORAD in there, they can run those rigs from there. And they can talk to the guy who's got his hand on the throttle all the time. And he invested in that. That cost a fortune. And nobody else had ever thought of that. And, you know, oil went up, but the revenues of his company, how many times is that? They've gone up 22 times since he took it over. And I, I invite you to think about this, because, by the way, this is, I like to say, we live our human lives in the context of our families, in the context of making a living, and in the context of our faith. Those are the places where we do the struggles that human life is measured by. And we all live our lives in the same way. They unfold in time. And we don't know what tomorrow will bring. And so very much of what we do, you choose according to doubtful outcomes, and you choose because it just seems the right direction. And you're going to try that because you believe in it. And you'll feel good if it works. And so many things are like this particular case. It's more risky to do it this way. Why do it now when everything is bad? When everybody's losing money? When everybody's laying stuff off? When you've got a stock price and they're going to watch how much money you borrow? And they're going to watch your revenues like crazy? And they're going to measure all that quarter to quarter. So as I say, uh, we meet here today not only a delightful man, but also a brave man, Hans Helmerich. Well, you have an introduction like that, and then you ask yourself on your way up, is there any way I could just stay seated? <laughs> I was also caught up in the collective disappointment when Larry came to the podium. I shared your disappointment on, oh, we just as soon hear Larry for the next 30 minutes, and then you are going to be stuck with a contract driller for a little bit. But I really appreciate Larry, those comments, I, I remember our time in my living room when we had that conversation about pricing strategy and how do you kind of extract the value proposition from a customer if you're bringing lots of efficiency to bear and just kind of like you heard, he, he went into this very thoughtful, uh, sequential, logical approach to what he would do and how he would handle it. and. I thought, boy, what other college president in the country could you have this conversation with? And I, I question that there's another one out there. And then just to hear him talk about work, family, and faith, we, we've had some success with, with the flex rig and with the company, but you know, I've often thought uh, I would trade any success there for success with my family and then being able to have a faith journey that uh, is is honoring to the calling and so we are 
similar in that respect. All of us have to cope with how we define success and whether we put too much priority in our careers and it becomes at the expense of our walk of faith and our relationships with our family. So that's been a priority that I don't want to fail at. Well, you guys are nice uh, for listening during lunch. We had a great day yesterday and Oftentimes these conferences, you know, have a great start and the lunchtime guy is a little disappointed and you tolerate him and then it picks back up in the afternoon and the evening and then tomorrow is going to be a great day. So if that happens, just know that's a typical pattern. Don't, don't <laughs> have too much disappointment around it. A, a great man said that we live in terrible uh, this is a terrible and glorious time to be alive. I'm borrowing, of course, from Dr. Arne. And, and it's true. Uh, I think of the glorious aspect of that for, for our industry. It's been great to see just American ingenuity. We've played a very small part in it, and it, it's been fun to be part of that ride. But w w what a great run uh, the American energy industry is engaged in right now. And, and it should be a source of, of great national pride. It should be something, I, I think historians will look back and say, my goodness, they were following this kind of trajectory of, of depleting their reserves, and, and then somehow, in 2002, that was reversed out, and within 12, 14 short years, they became the number one natural gas producer in the world. We're closing in on being the number one oil producer in the world. It, it almost defies human logic to think that the industry has enjoyed the type of renaissance uh, that in fact we have. Just, just last 12 months we've added another net million barrels to our production. So you've got to think oil well declines and so you have this wedge where you have to just work hard on the hamster wheel to stay even but, but to net add the, the type of uh, gross production we've seen both on gas and, and oil have been just amazing. It's been glorious. Terrible, terrible because we have those that do oppose us. Similar, Larry, to what you said about the college. We heard last night, what a great talk that was from Ann. Uh, I, would, I would love to well, I'd love to carry Larry around and do introductions from now on, but then I'd like to have Ann accompany me because she can say things that I have a difficult time saying and getting out alive with. Uh, but sure, her frustration with kind of the environmental crazies that she, she talked about, um, I, I think is well-founded. She, she talked about just the crusade they seem to be on against this oil and gas business, against the progress that we've made and how it's made. I, I loved how she talked about the importance of energy and how we take it for granted. I loved the picture of the ambulance and the notion, and it's true, and I've traveled in the world where you don't know if the hospital is going to have power for the next 24 hours. And we take so much for granted. She did a great job of pointing that out. And we have this great blessing. You remember the, the slide with all the shale opportunities? We, we have this unique blessing in the United States and, and so it, it just is frustrating that we have these zealots that seem so determined to, uh, at really no cost to themselves, to, to try to pull that out from under us. I, I liked Peter Grossman's comments about over time, the government declaring these energy crises, and then with no trust at all in free markets. You know, the things that Hillsdale students are hearing and teaching and learning about with the dynamics of a free market and capital going to opportunities that reward risk and, and provide a payoff for that, that the government just so misses that notion and gets so intimidated by a notion of, of scarcity that then, as Peter described, we have these goofy policies and they're counterproductive and they end up driving results that are just the opposite of what we would have hoped. John Cervini and I were taking a tour and I saw the Reagan statue uh, 
very well displayed on campus. And, and I was remembering a, a story of, and I'll shorten it, but having a chance to go to the White House with my Oklahoma senator, who was the chairman of the Energy Committee at the time. And it was in 81, and the industry was a graveyard. But, but Reagan got it. And even though we were really going kind of with this notion of, golly, this, this, is, a, this is a very, very difficult time, Reagan understood that, well, you go through times like this. And it has a disruptive but cleansing effect. And he believed in free markets. And the industry is a lot better for it. And he, he understood and, and got that right. You know, Ann had that slide. Who are these people? Do you remember that? And her slides, by the way, are a lot better than mine. I remember the one with the gal or the, whoever it was. I couldn't really tell that was afraid of hormones and milk. And then, but, but the, the, the thought that came to my mind is, well, who are they? But then why do they hate the business so much? What is it that makes them so uh, radicalized uh, against the oil and gas business and the success we have? And, and I, I think it is a threat to their utopian world of total renewable energy driving a major economic power forward and being able to compete with other major economic powers in the world today. This whole jobs war that our children and grandchildren will be engaged in, uh, it, it's difficult to, after the tens of billions of dollars, Peter told us since 92, that have poured into the wind and solar subsidies, it still generates just under 3% of our electrical power today. So thank goodness we've had the success we've had in the oil and gas business. Now it won't hurt some of those folks because they'll still drive the Volvo, they'll still have the double shot latte, espresso, something, hot showers, in some cases jets, but, but they're able to preach against it really at no cost, but who it hurts is the working man. Who it hurts is the American worker who now has a chance to have factories repatriated to the United States. It, it hurts uh, the folks that are paying for their heating bills, paying for energy, and when they can get it in a dependable way, cheap, they're much, much better off. I'm gonna take you quickly through, Larry did a better job at this than these slides do, so I'm going to accelerate some of the story, but what I want to do is tell you a little bit just about the role we've played and then kind of reflect for a second just on some of the government involvement in this. Well, this is a good example. Every time I give a talk, I have this, I won't make you read it, but it basically says don't depend on anything I say. It's a forward-looking SEC requirement. and. It says not to trust anything you may hear in the rest of the presentation. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna run through this quickly. We're, we are the largest land provider today. We have 290 rigs running as, as we speak. We, we also have, have the largest highest and highest returns on uh, capital, on daily margins. Uh, we lead in kind of every known category. We have a chance to be in most of the major basins from Bakersfield to Pennsylvania, from North Dakota to the tip of South Texas. We also have an international presence that's smaller just because the opportunity set is so great here. We've been able to have a great growth ramp with really no net debt on our balance sheet. So it's, it's been gratifying to be able to keep a strong balance sheet in the midst of growth. Larry mentioned we have 11,000 employees today. This is a deal that was formed by a handshake between Bill Payne and my granddad in 1920. And then Dad and I, he, he started in the company in 1950, was CEO in 1960. I became CEO in 89. And as uh, Larry mentioned, I'm now chairman. And they found a stronger, smarter, better looking guy to, to do the job that I was doing. But I, I like just mentioning, well, yeah, a lot better looking, thank you. <laughs> but John started on the rig floor, and uh, he worked his way through school, 
then got his engineering degree, he had interned for us, and, and then instead of just kind of taking the three, four months of being exposed to the, our field operations, which we really require of all of our engineers, all the engi we, we're very engineering centric, we have several hundred engineers in the company, and instead of doing a rotation, which we require of everyone, John stayed on and worked his way up through the driller position, and it becomes very inspirational to our guys that, that follow under his leadership now. We've worked together for 25 years, and he's going to do a great job for us. You know, I show this slide, you've seen it. The barometer in the business is what the rig count happens to be, and you see where the shale revolution begins on the far left. I, I like this slide because I remind people when a drilling rig shows up it's, it's like a little factory. It has 20 direct employees but then it has a multiplier of, of several times of that and so you think about rural America and um, having an opportunity to attract five or ten drilling rigs where the starting pay is seventy thousand dollars for a floor hand we've got a lot of ex-military a lot of guys that just have their high school education but understand hard work understand how to do things uh, that's where our money is made we're very field centric on what makes this business go and so just seeing that the, the gray is the overall rig count we're we're in the blue but I, I think the point of it is that this is good for America. Peter Grossman was talking yesterday about when prices go down, you see that little dip. Gas prices right before that were $12 and they went to $2. Everyone redirected their drilling rigs to oil and the market, without the government help, so strangely, is able to figure out the go forward. Uh, Ann had a slide like this. I kind of liked hers better, but uh, I, I did want to put this up just because I think it's important that folks understand, and, and what you can't really show there, you have to compress the depth. So our average vertical section in a well today is over 10,000 feet deep. So all, all your aquifers are occurring 200 to 400 feet deep, and we are way, way beyond uh, where those are at risk. And as she mentioned, there, there's been no there's, there's been no proof of water contamination in over a million wells drilled that have uh, been fracked. But what I wanted to show you on, on this was just the neat thing that happened along the way in the energy revolution was America's unique and not only do we have, like she mentioned, the private royalties where they're incentivized to take the value, especially in producing formations or non-commercial formations that can become productive. What, what we had here was also the mapping, if you will, of lots and lots of wells that had been drilled. So where you see that well bore go horizontal, we knew that that formation existed. It was just non-commercial. It was kind of a junk rock. So you'd put a piece of pipe there, it would be perforated, but nothing would come through. So George Mitchell and others figured out, well, we can design a completion that allows us to frack into that rock and allow it to flow. And then when you think about when you drilled vertically through a junky semi-commercial pay zone and you only exposed your well bore to eight or ten feet of it, made it harder. But if you could turn and if you could go horizontal and if you could run a lateral section where you could expose half a mile, a mile, mile and a half of pay zone to that well bore, then that well became very commercial and, and a, a real barn burner. They, they made a mistake. It, it's been misnamed. We should have come up with something better than fracking. We should have some kind of term hydraulic rock therapy or <laughs> some type of something with massage in it or, or something. <clears throat> But it, it, it's a great breakthrough in terms of completion technology. And what we found, and, and Larry was nice to talk about, is we had actually designed and built the flex rig prior to this. And our notion was we can just go vertically faster and better and safer than anybody in the business. And we were going to make a living doing that. A nice thing happened. 
Our customers wanted to build a curve and then drill 1,000 feet horizontally, and then 5,000, and then 10,000, and there just were no tools to do that. There were no drilling rigs capable of doing that at the time, except the flex rig. And the race was on, and we began to build two, and then three, and then four of those rigs a month. I told my wife we drove by an intersection in town where they're putting up a new stoplight, and I think it's been six months now, and I said, I can't understand how we can build four flex rigs a month and it takes them six months to put a new, s and I guess that's part of the government talk that we're <laughs> discussing. This, this slide just talks about, the, in the blue, it just shows where the business is going. So today, 80% of the drilling activity now deals in a horizontal effort. And so it's really just transformed the business. This gives you a picture, if, you, if we have any shareholders, I didn't want them to be disappointed that I talked without one picture of the flex rig. So I, if you want more pictures, see me afterwards. I'll, I'll uh, be happy to. But we did introduce a tool that was able to accomplish the customer's higher requirements and address the well complexity in these long laterals. And we not only designed it, but we built it. I'll show you a slide on that. This, this, is another model that has pad capabilities. It was the first in the business to be able to drill on a pad. So when you think about the environmental impact that that allows you to really reduce by 80 plus percent the number of locations when you can drill over 20 wells on a pad and you, you build it once and then you slide it around and, and it reduces the number of support and truck traffic. That's been a nice innovation. This is the Flex 5 which is kind of now the new flagship in the rig. Do you remember Ann Sand, the, the Getty and the Hammer Museums? There, we've got one in Tulsa, the Gilcrease, I wish you'd come visit, but that have been really supported by energy money. Uh, I, I love the idea of, of putting an oil derrick in front of all of those museums, so I'm having our marketing guys pursue that idea. <laughs> this just shows some of the innovations that uh, represent some of our uh, IP or internet or proprietary, and I won't go through that with you except to say it really has created a, a tool that is over 50% better. We're, we're in the Bakken, she, she talked about being in North Dakota. When we arrived there four years ago, those wells on average were 50 days. Uh, now we've tripled the length of the lateral and we're drilling those wells in 16 days. So that type of efficiency capture creates huge value for the customer. I, I liked reading about, even though, like you, I shook my head when I heard about Hillary Clinton talking about business and corporations don't add jobs, and then our president you know, made the statement that you didn't build that. I'd love for him to come down to Greensport, and we'd turn around where we have 500 employees that take sheet steel on one end, and a finished, completed rig comes out on, on the other end. And I think it might do him some good to, to see that Americans really can build things. Our, our competitor went to China to build their rigs. Uh, we stayed here not because we had government incentives to do it, but we liked the American work ethic. We liked the um, well joints, the precision and the product that we received and so it was something that again paid off for us handsomely. This is what Larry and John saw that he mentioned and we are able to kind of read the dashboard of every rig uh, real time in the fleet and we drive a lot of drilling optimization by being able to uh, support our field operations this way. It's a fun tour if you're in Tulsa it's a, it's a fun thing to show off and and see, so I'd be happy to have you come look at that. You know, we get a, an interesting, I, I put this up just to say we, we are in different countries in the world. We get a different lens on how different governments treat their energy business. Uh, some much better than ours, some worse than ours. We, we had 11 rigs nationalized in Venezuela. It's no longer on the map, but you know, that's, that's a government energy policy gone gone bad in, in spades, and remarkably, with the second or third largest oil reserves, Venezuela imports oil today. 
And none of those rigs they nationalized, maybe one or two uh, is working today. And you, you worry because that's a real world example where uh, the, the government becomes uh, not only just a drag, but a, a threat to a thriving energy industry. This shows the growth ramp that we've enjoyed. I, I use this slide to say we know how to build the iron. We've been able to uh, have a nice organic growth ramp. But what makes this possible are the people behind it and the mentoring and the training and really the culture of the company and the values that, that we champion and having guys that are willing to spend their careers working with us and helping us become better. We, we have a thousand employees with over 10 years experience. We recognize them at a dinner every year. We have 475 that have been with the company over 20 years. We have 70 that have been with the company 30 years. So it's that continuity of effort and their willingness to help us mentor and coach young people that make that type of growth possible. We're, we're proud of this. As, as an industry, we've continued to do better and better in terms of safety. So what you're seeing is a recordable or incident rate per 200,000 man hours worked. This is one of the areas where we, we have lots of proprietary uh, technology, but this is one of the areas we conduct multiple clinics on and we'll get with competitors and the customer and say, here's what you can do to make your safety better. Because if we can share an idea or a technique or a way to keep a young man from from danger, then we're happy to do that. E even still, we have a significantly better incident rate than the industry. This is a, a comparative share price, which at, at the end of the day is our scorecard. I like that right before oil went from $100 to $80, but that's part of the business, and we can talk later about where that might head. Okay, that's a summary slide just on some of the things that I think we do well and have to do well to continue. You know, one of the great things about a free market is we've got guys chasing us every day. And we have people that get up in front of investors and saying, we're trying to be the next Helmer campaign. And so we wake up worried and thinking about what makes it harder for them to compete with us and how can we do this better. And it's, it's a great part of, of a free market. I want to just make a couple of comments because I want to save maybe a, few, a couple minutes just for some questions if, if you have any. You know, no one's arguing for no government regulation. There's, there's a playing field and an impartial judge and, and, and an approach to the business that government has a role in. Um, we'd like it to be clear. We'd like it to be timely and fair. But I think it's important, you know, to say that that no, no one is saying, hey, let's just turn this loose. But it, it is a question of what is the right balance. Here are the number. Are you, I, I know you can't read that as well as I'd like. Here, here are the number of agencies, though. You get a feel for it. Federal agencies. One of the things Hillsdale students learn is the Constitution was right when it said, let's empower the states. And the states do a great job in their role as regulators of energy. Here's federal agencies that are engaged in the regulation, not just of the energy business, but of fracking. So you, you might have a hard time seeing the Department of Defense, the Army Corps of Engineers, the Department of Transportation. One of my favorites is FEMA. So if you have an area that has flooded private land, they will compensate you for that flooding on some goofy formula. But one of the provisos is you can never frack on land that they've compensated you for. So FEMA's in the fracking business. The Coast Guard regulates the types of fluids that might be transported involved with fracking. So it's frustrating. If you look at government regulations from 1997 to 2012, the, the telephone book thick government regs continue to grow. During that time period, they grew 26%. During the same time period, energy regulations grew 145%.
So if you didn't think anything could outpace the speed of government regulations being added, you were right, except if you're in the energy business, we go five to one in terms of increased regulations. The feds say that states aren't adequate in their control or regulation of energy, and you know I could go through these. We won't take the time to do that. Those are the top producing states and the different types of requirements, permitting, regulations, compliance, and it's very comprehensive. And so I would argue today that they're better suited, they're closer to the people, they understand the farmers and landowners and transportation and infrastructure needs, and they're the better player to be involved in this. I think they do it in a pretty full, comprehensive way. You know, this, this is a slide that if you think of the government as a fiduciary and a steward of public lands, to me it's disappointing that 90% of all known gas reserves on federal lands, 92% of all known oil reserves are off limits to the industry. So we are fence road away from even being able to explore and develop energy on over 90% of federal lands. If you're offshore, that number falls to 87%. So thankfully we still have the Gulf of Mexico. But, but it's, it's, it's a frustrating aspect of, of government intervention. Uh, the, the real weapon that we see all the time and customers complain about and we, we just see the uh, terrible results of is government delay, permitting delay. So only 6% of the BLM permits that are by law required to be completed in 30 days, only 6% of those are in fact completed. Their average time is 229 days. So the state of Colorado, which is a very fierce regulator, they are able to do it in 27 days. Ohio, 14 days. North Dakota, 10 days. The average on federal lands, 229 days. This is kind of a proof in the pudding slide. It shows oil production on federal lands, and on top you see the increase on non-federal lands. So those are in private hands and they're up nearly 30 percent. On federal lands, so when you hear Obama talk about and, and push his way to the head of the parade on how great the energy business is doing, the only piece he's responsible for at, at a time when you've had a 30 percent increase are the bottom two lines and they've actually dropped 7 percent. I don't have the natural gas slide up, it's actually a little bit worse. Natural gas on non-federal lands is up 40 percent and on federal land down 23 percent. Okay, if I were a little bit more worked up and we had a little bit more time, I would take longer to describe this nasty business of sue and settle. I don't know if you've read about it, Google it. It, it is really a fraudulent abuse of government power. And the way it works is you have a top job at the EPA. Tom Sire, Steyer hires you at one of his high dollar environmental groups. In that new position, you sue your old buddies at the EPA or at the Fish and Wildlife. And instead of working through that in a good faith manner, they rush to the table to settle. And in the settlement, they agree to these onerous requirements that both sides secretly want to impose on the oil and gas business. Then insult to injury is they agree in the settlement for the environmental group to have its legal fees paid for. So between 2000 and 2009, the Sierra Club was in 194 lawsuits against the EPA and received $19 million reimbursement on their legal fees. You know, it's just a travesty, and I think it's a huge violation of the proper role of government. It's actually worse. I could give you lots of examples. I'll reference you to a great article if you're interested in it. This is a quote that I like, and, and I like that Larry at the table was talking about Aristotle, and, and his, his take on this is that 
the rule of law that the law should govern and those in power should be servants of that law. But that's not what we have today. We have regulators, particularly with the leadership of the White House, uh, abusing this position and attacking an industry that I think is very important that it succeeds and helps us differentiate ourselves in our competitive efforts in the world. It's fun for me to be on campus and to see what a beacon Hillsdale is in a real world argument that has real consequences to each one of us. And to know that students are being taught respect for free markets, the rule of law, constitutional rights. Now we need, Larry, for them to be sent forth and correct some of these ills. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed being with you. Thank you. Matt, I think we have a couple minutes, and you guys give me the timeout time. But if you have any questions or are there things that um, you'd like, I'm, I'm going to be around for time two. I'm happy to grab you in the hallway. Uh, Hans, you, you talk about the exorbitance when oil went from 80 to 100. Do you remember when it went from four to 30? That was when we really had an exuberance in the oil industry. Yeah, he was talking about when oil prices went down to four. I can, I can remember, I should have framed it, the cover of The Economist magazine, and it said $5 oil. I don't know if you guys remember that. But that's about when Larry, maybe that was a little after Larry did his visit. He asked me how I was sleeping. I said, I sleep like a baby. I sleep for a couple hours wake up, cry, <laughs> go back to sleep for a couple hours. So no, it's, it's um, but as Peter Grossman said, that, that is, is part of the greatness, is the cyclicality is, you know, in, in the seeds of high prices are corrective forces that bring about less demand and it's a self-correcting mechanism and so what we would like, you know, I, th I think about showing the slides of, of uh, some of the things our guys have been able to do at the company, and I think energy department has over 20,000 employees, e employees, tens and billions of dollars, but where they might have shown up and helped was in some of the things we talked about, but thankfully they weren't around, and so our guys designed the rig, we did the training, there are 45 federal training programs. Thankfully, none of them got in our way. And, well, you know my sentiments. Okay, other questions? Well, thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your time oh, here. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, sure. Uh, wait. Is, is the rest of the world uh, waking up to the horizontal uh, drilling that we're doing in this country? Well, they're certainly interested in it. We're sending 10 rigs down to Argentina. There's a neokin play that's a world-class unconventional shale play and Argentina's a mess and they need our help and they need our customers help to e exploit that opportunity. The US has some great advantages I might have touched on. One is you have this grand mapping of subsurface strata that you know you can go revisit. Other countries don't have that. We just have a, a great infrastructure of support that makes this effort work better and the private royalty mineral ownership is, is a big driver. So it is slow, it will be slow. You have, if you think our environmentalists are crazy, go over to Europe and talk to the ones in Paris. Um, they're holding up some great potential there. It's a crazy world out there. You'd think that uh, with, with the role Russia's plan that the Poles and, and uh, the other prospective unconventional gas plays would get more traction than they're getting. But it's a good question. Yes, sir. Uh, in the business of oil drilling, who is your customer? Okay. Um, our job, I could have been clearer about this. We really show up and drill the well bore. And so our, our biggest customer today is 
Oxy, followed by Continental. So it, it's the big shale players, uh, Marathon, uh, Chevron. I, we, we tend to have the, the majors that appreciate our, our best in class safety and performance, but they're the customer and we turn over that well bore, we get off of the location, Halliburton or Schlumberger shows up with the pressure pumping, with the completion services, and then they do the well completion. We end up being about 30% of the AFE well cost. So we play a, a smaller role in providing that kind of overall service. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. I used, I used to work in the power industry field, and we dealt a great deal with government bureaucracies. Each one of these bureaucracies is headed by a little dictator who requires all of his people to agree with what he wants. It's kind of like having all of your employees in a swimming pool that's filled with liquid manure all the way up to their nose. And if, and if the leader says, as I've noticed on I-94, we need to put up some signs because we haven't done anything recently, so we'll put up signs telling people how long it takes to go from Kalamazoo to Jackson. And one of his members might say, well, it's 49 miles and they're driving 60. It's going to take them about 50 minutes. And one of the other guys taps him on the shoulder and says, don't make any waves. <laughs> <laughs> They're standing in manure up to their nose. Don't make any waves. I'm familiar with that swimming pool. Yeah. So I found this fun, but maybe I'm a geek. Why is AC current better than DC current? Describe that revolution. Yeah, okay. I've got guys that explain this a lot better than I do, but so there were three phases of, of power or chapters in the in power of a drilling rig. One was diesel, mechanical, and there's still 350 diesel rigs out there today. Then, then they figured out we are an early converter to SCR diesel electric where you are doing direct current. And then the AC power is really superior in lots of ways, Larry. It is a smaller footprint, has about 30 percent of the moving parts. Uh, it, it keeps you from, you can, it has great torque characteristics in that you don't burn up a motor by bringing the power way down. Uh, it also just is a much better platform for lots of automation and better controls. So you know, we're able to overlay lots of system controls, lots of automation to a drilling rig. We can take a Caterpillar engine and get 45 different readouts in terms of remote diagnostics, understanding that. We actually understand it better than CAT does. I, I've met with their head of technology and our guys uncrate a CAT engine and they replace it with eight parts that we've had customized because we know they're prone to fail in the field and, and they're not as robust as they should be. And I was explaining this to Cat and saying, you know, we have 880 of your engines, and it was a, a gal, and she said, well, you're really not one of my top 50 customers. And I said, okay, well, I understand. Uh, and, and I walked away thinking, it's better, because our competitors are just getting the normal Cat engine out of the crate. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, we did. We did, so. Thankfully, we've got a lot of smart guys working over there. And hey, this has been a lot of fun for me. Thanks for your attention. I appreciate being here very much. Thank you again, Hans. He's given me permission to call him Hans, so I feel honored. Uh, thank you for that wonderful speech. Uh, directly after the luncheon here, over in the lecture space, will be an antidote to the Common Core the Barney Charter School Initiative, and that will be a round table uh, with Dr. Copeland Rebecca, and Rebecca Fleming uh, from the, that work here in the college. Uh, please enjoy your afternoon and we'll see you back here at four o'clock for the afternoon speech. Thank you. <laughs>